Thank you, Abe. I think it goes right. There are invisible marks on the floor. That looks good. Uh, so glad that you're all with us as we continue in our series, The Gospel in Genesis. Let's pray together. Father, you brought us here this morning on a uh, relatively warm February morning. Some of us uh, hurried to get here, but we're here now. And we ask that you would slow our minds and our hearts down, prepare us to hear from your word. We thank you that your word is living and active. We pray these things in the name of the living word made flesh, in Jesus' name, amen. Corey Ten Boom, uh, you might know her from the hiding place, some of you know her name at least. She once wrote that if the devil cannot make you sin, he will make you busy. I think there's truth in that statement. Both sinfulness and busyness have, among other things, the effect of disconnecting us from our relationship with God, with one another, and with ourselves, our own souls. They cut us off, as it were, from the relationships that matter most. We are, I think, busy in our culture, rushed, in a hurry. We wear busyness as a badge of honor, right? How, you have to ask people, how are you? Good, good, really busy. As if it's, a, it's a, we should be proud of. Do you know that God is never busy? God's never in a hurry. God's never rushed. I challenge you to read through the Gospels and find one account of Jesus where he's super stressed out and just in a big rush. It's not there. We are, he's not. Not only are we busy and hurried, I think we're also very distracted as a culture. T.S. Eliot in his long, beautiful poem, The Four Quartets, in one portion says, in this Twittering world, this is long before Twitter, we are distracted from distraction by distractions. You have to think about that for a minute. Filled with fancies and empty of meaning. You've heard the term distracted driver, right? Looking at your phone, I see some of you, I've done it, right? But what about distracted living? Distracted life. Stress and anxiety levels are up, attention spans are down. Here is the reality. Over time, eventually, what you give your time and your attention to over the course of years is what you become. And in this series, we've been trying, hopefully more than once a week, to give our time and our attention to the Word of God, specifically to the first three chapters of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, to lay a foundation for understanding who we are, who God is, how we're supposed to live in this world and relate to him and to each other. Last week, we looked at uh, one of the most profound doctrines in all the Bible. It's foundational, though we have lost our connection to it in our, our culture today, the Imago Dei, the image of God. What does it mean to be made in God's image? And then we, that was the end of chapter one of Genesis. And chapter two begins with a brief but incredibly important account of the very last day of creation. So let's stand together, and I'll read from Genesis chapter 2, uh, excuse me, 1 verse 31 to 2 verse 3. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated. The seventh day of creation is unique in the creation account. For one thing, nothing new is created on the seventh day. Days one through six, God is busy. He's got work to do. He's speaking things into existence. He's fashioning things and making things. But on day seven, nothing new is created. 
by God's word or God's activity. Another thing that's interesting about the seventh day and that's unique is apparently it has no end. Did you notice that? There's no end of day formula. Throughout the first six days, there was evening, there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day, and so on. But when it comes to the seventh day, we do not get the evening, morning, end of day formula. Apparently, the seventh day has no end, which has really interesting, fascinating theological implications we'll get to later on in the sermon. I want to talk to you about the purpose, power, practice, and promise of Sabbath that which God established on the seventh day. First, the purpose of Sabbath. It's really amazing to think about this fact that in the story of creation, it ends on day six, the creation of human beings, and then day seven, a day of rest. That the end, the conclusion of the story of creation is a day of rest. Sabbath rest is part of creation. The creation story is not over. In Genesis 1, verse 31, God saw everything that he made, and it was very good. Very good, but not apparently finished yet. He's done with the work of creation, but the story of creation is not over until God rests in it. Easy to miss that point. God rested. Did you catch that? God rested. Yesterday, Saturday, I had nothing to do all day, which was incredibly unusual for me. I had no appointments to keep, no meetings to have. I wasn't preaching Saturday night service. I had no church work to do. The sermon was already done. Like, I had nothing to do. And I was kind of bored. I don't know what to do with myself. Do you have those days ever? They seem rare for me. What should we do? How about nothing? Nothing. How about naps and a whole lot of nothing when my wife and I were talking? Because I need a day of recovery because I get tired. Is God recovering? Was he worn out and fatigued? No, not at all. What does it mean to see that God rested? What is God resting from? Certainly not any need within himself to be restored. Look at verse three, chapter two, verse three. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. I want you to notice three words here in this verse. Blessed, holy, rested. God blessed the seventh day, God made it holy, and God rested. The Hebrew word for holy is the word kadash. It shows up over 150 times in the Old Testament. We see all kinds of things that are declared holy. The tabernacle is declared holy. The temple is declared holy. Priests are declared holy. The mountain of the Lord is declared holy. The altar is declared holy. There's lots of stuff that are declared holy, and the word kadash simply means set apart, separate, for God's divine purpose. Isn't it interesting that the very first thing in the universe to be declared kadash, holy, is a day, is actually time. This day is to be set apart for a different purpose, a day of rest. All of this, of course, foreshadows the fourth commandment that God gave to Moses. Because if you know something about, and by the way, the, day, the Sabbath day, the day of rest, is established in creation, but it's not given as a law until much later with the establishment of the people of God. It's, it's part of the rhythm of how God created, but it's not a law that we have to follow until Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant. I told all my servants yesterday, no work. <laughs> or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, 
The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You see, the book ends there. God made it holy, so you, his people, keep it holy. Because he made it that way. What's the reason or the rationale given in this part of the Ten Commandments for our keeping of the Sabbath day? God says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Why? Because that's how God created. See the rationale? That's how God made the universe. So to have a day of rest is to live in line with how God made you and made all that exists. Not to is to live against the grain of the universe. As far as we know, the ancient Israelites were the only people in ancient history to have a day of rest. The weekend, one of the great gifts of the Bible to human culture. A day off. Now, what's interesting is when you come to Deuteronomy chapter 5, when the law is repeated, that's what Deuteronomy means, the repetition of the law, the second giving of the law, the same command is given, but there's a different rationale. Let's look at this from Deuteronomy 5. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. So far the same. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, the sojourner who's within your gates. So far the same, right? That your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember, what's different here? That you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You see the difference? In Exodus, keep the Sabbath day because that's how God made you in the world. In Deuteronomy, keep the Sabbath day because don't forget, you were slaves. You were once in bondage. Now, slaves can't say to their masters, hey, uh, um, time out. I know uh, today's uh, the Sabbath, and so we're not, we're not making any bricks today. We're not working today. It's our day off. They don't, they don't have that option. And God is saying to his people, remember, you were once in bondage. You were once in captivity. You were once slaves to a master outside of yourselves. But you're not anymore. And the Sabbath keeping is a day when you remind yourself you are not a slave to your work. You are not a slave to your labor. You are not a slave to your to-do list. In, in a way, Resting, a day of rest, is like a declaration of freedom. It certainly was for God's people in, in ancient Israel. It is for us today, too. A day of declaring, God's in control of the universe. I'm not. His work is sufficient. Mine isn't. And I rest in him at least one day. The rest is to, to declare that you are not a slave to your work, to your to-do list, to your agendas, to your need for control. It's a declaration of your, of your freedom in Christ. This brings us to the power and practice of Sabbath. In the Old Testament, to break the Sabbath was a capital offense. It was a serious pro problem if you, if you did not obey the Sabbath. We see nothing like that in the New Testament, by the way. In the Old Testament, it's very clear the Sabbath is a serious law. It gets repeated, and breaking it carries serious consequences. In the New Testament, there's no such law repeated. It's the only one of the Ten Commandments that in the New Testament isn't reiterated as a law for God's people. Now, that's somewhat of an argument for silence. People debate this, but the point is, when it comes to the New Testament, it's, it feels like there's something that has shifted in terms of the day of rest. We'll talk about that in a minute. In fact, Jesus got in trouble. Do you know what day he was most often in trouble with religious leaders? The Sabbath. He was in trouble for breaking the Sabbath. There's a story in the Gospels when Jesus and his disciples were walking through the fields and they were hungry and it was a Sabbath day and they picked some heads of grain, rubbed them together and ate the kernels. The Pharisees saw them, which makes me think, were well, they just like spying all the time? From a distance and accused them of harvesting on the Sabbath. Now, there's no law in the Old Testament that you can't have a snack on the Sabbath day. But the Pharisees, the, the religious teachers, were so serious about not breaking the law to not work that they built what they called a fence or around the Torah, around the law. Other laws 
to prevent you from even coming close to breaking the law. And these codes over time, what happened is these religious leaders kind of lost the plot. They lost the plot of what Sabbath was for. And it became a burden to not, to not break the Sabbath. And Jesus has a remarkable experience there in Mark chapter 2, verses 27 through 28 when he's, a, when he's accused of this. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, way back in creation, was made what? For you, men and women. It's a gift for us. So yes, it's a law, a sign that you belong to God, you declare your freedom in him, but it's a gift given to us. We were not made for it, meaning we're not bound by it, Jesus is saying. He's Lord of the Sabbath. Now I think in the, in the New Testament era of Jesus, the people living under Jewish law and the, 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 the burden of the Pharisees' teaching needed to hear this second phrase, not man for the Sabbath. Because they lived with this assumption that we have to keep the law or we're in trouble. They needed to be liberated from that. I don't think that's our issue today. I think we desperately need the first section. The Sabbath was made for men. Most of you, while you have days off, you don't really have Sabbath. Not true rest. Not engagement with God. You, you, you have a day where you don't do your regular job, maybe two days, but what do you do with those days? You fill it with other work, stuff to do, stuff to accomplish, stuff to consume, stuff to buy, stuff to get done. That's not Sabbath. Not the way God intends it. God made the Sabbath, established it for us as a gift to us. The point here is that rest and work are partners. And, and spiritual rest is not just the absence of work. For example, some, those, who, those who do jobs that are, my son's a plumber's apprentice. He's on his feet all day. He said, one time he came, wise, how was your day today? He goes, well, I was up to my waist and uh, you don't want to know. I was like, okay. <laughs> Like you're working hard, you're turning wrenches, you're, you're using your physical exertion all day long. Rest might mean just sitting and doing nothing. But for some of us, sit behind computers, sit behind a desk all day. Rest might mean going for a walk and praying, having a great conversation with somebody about spiritual things. It's a gift given to us. It's a partner to our work. American culture has a complicated and I think corrupted relationship with what it means to work well and rest well. Do you know that the Japanese have a word for death by overwork? Karoshi. Death by overwork. Karoshi. Interestingly, Americans work on average 135 hours a year more than the Japanese. 250 hours a year more than the British. 450 hours a year more than the French. And we hear they go, yeah, we work hard. This is not a badge of honor, friends. And we also spend more on vacation and leisure activities. Work hard, play hard. I don't think that's at all what God intended in Genesis chapter 2. Abraham Joshua Heschel puts it this way in his remarkable book. He's a Jewish uh, scholar, a uh, book just called Sabbath. It was on the seventh day that God gave the world a soul. And the world's survival depends upon the holiness of the seventh day. He who wants to enter the holiness of the day must first lay down the profanity of clattering commerce, of being yoked to toil. He must go away from the screech of dissonant days, from the nervousness and fury of acquisitiveness, and the betrayal in embezzling his own life. He must learn to understand that the world has already been created and will survive without his help. Six days a week we wrestle with the world, wringing profit from the earth. On the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in the soul. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. We could, we could just ponder that quote for a while. One of the fundamental principles of the Sabbath is that rest involves both ceasing from some things 
and engaging in some things. When God rested, he was not tired. He did not need to recover, but he was engaging, delighting in his creation. There is rest that is recovery from something. There is also rest that is delighting in something. We need both. So when God rested, he's delighting in all that he made. It was very good. And part of creation is to stop and enjoy it. When we rest, we delight in him who made it all and us and did the same. In this way, the Sabbath is an invitation. So it establishes a rhythm of creation. It's a law given to God's people. It's a gift given of grace, Jesus says. It's also an invitation given to us. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Who does that include? Anybody here worn out? Anybody here feeling weary? Anybody here feeling weighed down with the cares and your to-do list and the stuff you have to get done? If, if, you're not, if you're not or have never been labor or heavy laden with worry, with care, with stuff to accomplish, then you're exempt from this. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I think we tend to think of people in the ancient world as, you know, they didn't have much to do. They didn't have like uh, all the distractions, technology, the pace of modern life. This has always been a human issue. The struggle to rest, to truly rest and connect with the one who made us and who loves us. We don't rest well. What an invitation Jesus gives us. Everyone here this morning and watching online who has or feels right now worn out, weary, weighed down, Jesus says, come to me and learn from me. Let me teach you what it looks like to slow down and to rest. Marva Dawn wrote a book called Keeping the Sabbath Holy. See what she did there? Here's what she writes. Sabbath keeping means to cease not only from work itself, but also from the need to accomplish and the need to be productive. From worry and tension that accompany our modern criterion for efficiency and productivity. To cease from our efforts to be in control of our lives as if we were God. From our possessiveness and finally from the humdrum and meaninglessness that result when life is pursued without the Lord at the center of it all. The meaninglessness of pursuing a life without the Lord at the center of it all. You need at least one day a week to stop and go, well, I need to recenter. I need to refocus. I need to recalibrate. Okay, but how? How do we rest? Like specifically, what are the things you should do and not do? I'm going to give you a list of things you have to do this week. Are you ready? That'll help you rest. <laughs> But it's a question worth asking. Let me tell you what it's not. Spiritual rest, Sabbath keeping, is not just escapism. It's not just checking out and me time. I can sit and scroll and look at your posts for hours. That is not spiritual rest. I can get lost in YouTube videos of animals attacking humans, <laughs> and that is not spiritual rest. I can watch Netflix, binge Netflix shows. My wife and I watched this show called Shetland. It's about, this, uh, it's about the Shetland Islands in the, uh, off the coast of Scotland and this police officer who's, there's only like 40,000 people living on these islands and like if there's this many murders, they're not all, they're gonna be nobody left. But we just watched the whole show because of the accents and the cool sweaters and the scenery. <laughs> that's not, that's fun, it's not rest. There's nothing wrong with some, some indulgence now and then. But that's not the heart of what God is saying with rest. It's not binging and mindless scrolling. In fact, quite frankly, I think that our phones are one of the biggest barriers to true rest. It certainly is for me. Rest is slowing down and intentionally ceasing. That's what the word in Hebrew means. God rested, God stopped. From those activities which distract us, 
exhaust us. And intentionally engaging in those activities which fill us, connect us to Christ, and where we experience true joy. So I think that's a good filter for you. How do you know if you're resting, if you're keeping the law, right? If you're stepping into the invitation, if you're receiving the gift, are you taking time throughout your week, a day and throughout the week, to stop doing those things which wear you out and exhaust you and distract you, and to engage in those activities which fill your soul and connect you to the love of God? Rest is not work's adversary. Rest is work's partner. That, that's a quote from the book called Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less, written by Alex Pang. I first heard about Alex Pang on John Dixon's podcast on deceptions. He's got a whole episode on rest. You should go back and listen to it. I think it's season five, episode 11, but you can find it. It's fantastic. Uh, he says, Pang says, he outlines the way that uh, contemporary neuroscience, psychology, sleep research, sociology, all these sciences in the last decade or so are discovering or rediscovering how healthy work rhythms and good rest actually are good for creativity and productivity. And there's a sense in which what Pang's outlining, which is true, is like just rediscovering what Genesis has told us all along. It's like they, these social scientists discover this stuff and find out, oh, wait a second. God knew this from the beginning. It's been there all along. Okay, another big question I'm sure you have is like, well, what's the day? When? What's the magic day where I get the most rest and to keep the law? Is it Saturday or is it Sunday? The Jewish week began, of course, on Sunday. So Shabbat was observed at the end of the week, from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. That was the law that was strictly kept. The early church in the New Testament and beyond seems to have reinterpreted the, uh, this idea of the Lord's Day for Sunday, which was the first day of the week, the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. And so they appear to have, although they don't, it's not expressly said in the New Testament, created Sunday as the day of the Lord's worship and rest. Interesting, there are no New Testament commands specifically given to Christians in any of Paul's letters, any New Testament letters about the law to keep the Sabbath. But just because it's not given to us as a law does not mean it's not given to us as a gift, as divine wisdom, as grace, as an invitation to the right way to live. It absolutely is. So debates about what day I think are, are, are missing the point. The point is, God, when he created the world, it was not done until he stopped and delighted in all that he had made. And our lives are not right unless we set aside a day to stop and delight in him who made us and all that exists. It doesn't mean that you're sinning if you don't do that. It just means you're dumb. And you're gonna run yourself into the ground. This brings us lastly to the promise of Sabbath. The promise of Sabbath. Sabbath does not just point us backward to creation or backward to how the Jews observed it as a law. It points us forward to Christ and to Christ's return. I want you to think for a minute with me. The most restful and peaceful and soul-restoring time you've ever had. Maybe it was just a moment. Maybe it was a vacation, like your best vacation ever. Maybe it was some, some day off and you had this, I don't know what it was. Can you think of that? Can you think of the day, like a moment or a time in your life when it was like just you felt the most at peace? Maybe you're like, uh, no, I can't. That's another issue. You should call the office this way. <laughs> the best, most restful moment of my life and your life is only a t the tiniest glimpse of what awaits us. We're going to look in a couple weeks at how, how things have gone wrong in creation when we get to Genesis chapter 3. Why it's hard for us to slow down and to connect. Why that feels like it's swimming upstream to us. But there will come a day for those who belong to God in Christ when it won't be. When the, the most restful, restorative time you've ever had will be nothing compared to what awaits you. This is the promise of Sabbath. God accomplished the work of creation and Jesus accomplished the work of salvation. 
We stop once a week and throughout our week to delight in him and what he's made. And we all the time rest in the finished work of Christ. What did Jesus say on the cross? Well, many things. But one, the statement of accomplishment, of finality, it is finished. It's finished. And we are invited to rest in his finished work. Spiritually speaking, I think part of the reason the Sabbath day doesn't have an end to it is because it's an invitation to us to step into this life where you cannot earn God's favor or or grace or love or forgiveness. It's given to you. We are not under his law. We're under his grace. We receive it as a gift. You cannot work hard enough, be good enough, keep the law enough, be spiritual enough, pray enough, go to church enough, give enough, for God to say, this one has made it. But you can only receive his finished work on your behalf. He kept the law. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in a passage from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. And he's not just saying your work throughout the week, but you're striving to be good enough. You're working to measure up, to prove yourself spiritually. There remains. In in chapter four, verse one, the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. In verse three, he says, we who have believed in Christ have entered that rest. In verse six, he says, therefore, it remains for some to enter it. In verse nine, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's like this promise held out and it's being held out to you right now. Rest from the burden of carrying past wounds unforgiveness. Rest from the burden of carrying past failures and sins, the shame, that little voice in the back of your mind and says you're not good enough, if they only knew. Rest from the exhaustion of trying to prove yourself at work, at home, just in your soul. By the way, you know pastors struggle with that too? Trying to prove that we're worth something. I mean, I've heard that's true. (laughs) Rest from the fear and worry about the future. How many of you are there? Rest from anxiety about what if, what if, what if. Rest from your need to try to control your life. Remember what Marva Dawn said? As if you were God. Rest from pretending that you're okay. (laughs) You know you're not. Years ago, I remember walking into the church and I saw this guy I had gotten to know a little bit. I said, hey, how are you? He stopped. He said, do you really want to know? I'm like, uh, I think so. (laughs) And he proceeded to just unload on deep pain in his marriage and his family and his life. You would never have guessed it. He was the most put together guy I knew. Pretending, pretending, pretending for years. And finally, I'm not pretending anymore. He said, sorry, I didn't mean to unload on you, but I just decided I'm not pretending anymore. You're the first guy who asked. Rest from that. Relief from that. This is the invitation. Jesus says, come to me. If you've got regret, if you've got shame, if you've got unforgiveness, if you've got this need to prove yourself, if you're still trying to control it, if you're trying to pretend you're fine, just come to me and lay that stuff down. Take my yoke upon you and my burden is easy and light. Learn what rest is in him. That's the invitation. And think about this. From Genesis chapter two, when God wasn't done with the world. He created all that exists, but it wasn't right yet until he rested and delighted in it. And he invites us to live a life where we do the same. We delight in all that he's made and in his finished work for us at the cross. We can do nothing to add to that. We can only receive it as a gift. And all of this points us forward today when he returns and restores all things and we enter his eternal rest. We're going to finish, as you heard earlier, with, uh, with communion, with the Lord's Supper. Among, among many things that communion means, it's a, it's a communal supper, it's a time of remembrance, it's a time of thanksgiving. It's also a reminder to us that if you are in Christ, you are already perfectly loved by him. 
And if you're here this morning and Chapel Street's not your church home, that, that's okay. The only thing that matters to us is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You've trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins. You've turned over your life. It doesn't mean you're perfect or you have it all together, but it means I know that he's my only hope now and for all eternity. If that's true, then you're welcome to observe communion with us. It's a way of us, again, entering into his rest, his finished work on the cross. You've got these little cups. You'll notice on the bottom is a peel-off, on the top is peel-off, and the bottom is the bread. I'll pray, and we can, we'll take the bread first and then the cup together. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we pause now and acknowledge that we're busy and we're distracted people. We're in a hurry. We're, uh, we're, we're rushed, and you never are. And we only have just a few moments, but in these moments, we want to slow down and enter in again to your grace. To be reminded that in you, Lord Jesus, we already have all that we will ever need. As we sang a few moments ago, if you never did another thing for us, you've already done it all. And we can rest in what you've accomplished for us. And we can trust you. And we can lay down our burdens. Because you took them on the cross and paid for them. We thank you for that. Let's peel off that bottom layer. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He passed it to his disciples and he said, this is my body and it is given for you, the body of Christ, the bread of life. Eat and remember him. Scripture tells us that after they'd eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that every time we, his people, eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection, his finished work for us until he returns. Let's do that together. Amen. Before you go about your day, your weekend, the rest of this time, if you're here this morning, you need prayer. Someone to pray for you or pray with you. We have members of the prayer team every week back in the classroom. We'd love to connect with you and to encourage you through prayer. That should meet your need. Now, brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his rest and his peace. Amen.